Great. I think we'll get started here. Um, folks will continue to join us, uh, but let's get going. We've got a lot to talk about. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon um, to discuss something that's been at the top of many of our minds, the potential presence of and risks from COVID-19 in water. Uh, many of us do our work in water either by sampling or monitoring um, or managing that effort or we're just interested because we recreate in it. Um, so this has really been at the top of our minds. Uh, my fellow moderator, Chris Stepanak and I will be facilitating this conversation with our speakers, Sam Chan and his group of researchers from Oregon Sea Grant and Oregon State University. We're so glad to have you here. My name is Jill Carr. I'm with the Mass Bays National Estuary Partnership. Chris and I, in this work, we're building on previous efforts to um, continue a conversation around COVID and how to conduct aquatic work um, in these times. Our work together started in the spring. Uh, we both work with many volunteer organizations and um, citizen science groups who started reaching out to us with questions about how to conduct their work in COVID. Is it safe to send volunteers out? Is it safe to be in contact with water? Um, so back in the spring, we, we convened a brainstorming session to start talking about best practices in the field. There was a follow-up to that in June. And then there was another follow-up in July that really focused more on how to train your volunteers remotely um, while still being effective. All of these materials, if you've missed any of our previous webinars, they can be found on the website shown on the slide, volunteermonitoring.org slash COVID. All the materials from today's webinar will be there as well. So setting us up for the next 90 minutes together, first we're going to do a couple introductions of the scientists that we have to talk to us today, as well as some polls to get to know you all better, where you're calling in from, and what kind of work you're doing. The speakers will have about 15 minutes to share their research, and then we've left a, a nice big chunk of time for Q&A and discussion. Um, in our previous work, we've, we've really found that the discussion is very robust and there's a lot of learning um, happening and a lot of networking happening during that time. So we hope you'll stay on for all of that. Some housekeeping notes, of course, we're in Zoom um, that we all know and love by now. Uh, this is a Zoom webinar and we are recording. You're automatically muted. So the best way to reach out to us is through the Q&A box if you have specific questions for the panelists or you can use the chat box if you'd like to make an introduction of yourself or a discussion among the participants. Chris and I are gonna do our best to monitor both of those streams of um, communication, but really we're gonna be focusing most of our effort on that Q&A box to make sure we answer the scientific questions. And then also, so you know that th there will be real-time captioning available for this webinar. If that's a service that you'd like to take advantage of, there's a link, of, link to that in the chat box. You can click on that and follow the instructions to access captioning. And with that, Chris is going to introduce the great scientists we have on the line today. Thanks so much, Jill. I'm very excited about the, the group from Oregon Sea Grant that has come together for doing this research and to share with us. Uh, we have the, the, the leader of the, the team is Sam Chan, who's on the faculty of Oregon State University, and he serves as the Sea Grant Extension Statewide Watershed Health an aquatic invasive species specialist. Sam's work looks at the drivers for human induced changes to watersheds, invasive species pathways, and understanding people's behaviors to guide improvements to watershed and invasive species education and outreach. Sam was born in Hong Kong and grew up in San Francisco's Chinatown, one of the densest population centers in the US. Seeing daily deliveries of fresh seafood, meats, fruits and vegetables, and water on tap to sustain life in Chinatown, embarked Sam on his studies and career in natural resource sciences, physiology, research, education, and extension. Sam is mentoring the evolving work of this small team of students. He will introduce this webinar on the potential presence and risks of COVID-19 in the water environment and possible connections to your activities in water monitoring and outreach. Sam would like uh, to work with this group on developing effective and collaborative outreach on this topic following the webinar. So we hope to engage you in that conversation. With Sam and presenting today is Linda Cerniak-Tucker, 
Linda is a PhD candidate in the Environmental Sciences program at Oregon State University. She's currently researching the impacts of Asian jumping worms on soil nutrient dynamics, but she also has experience working in riparian and aquatic habitats, surveying invasive plants, monitoring water quality, collecting environmental DNA samples, and surveying bird communities. Linda is also passionate about education and is heavily involved in training new graduate teaching assistants at her university, including teaching a course for the college and university teaching certificate program. Linda's role today will be to summarize and review the nascent research on COVID-19 in the water environment. Next up, we have Daniel Arisa, who's an international undergraduate student from Nigeria studying at Green River College and majoring in psychology and learning about how science-based media can be applied for informing behavior change. After participating in a research focus group on Don't Pack a Pest, led by Tanya and Sam, Daniel's leading grassroots education programs at Green River College and more broadly to student travelers around the world to reduce the risks of spreading pests through academic travelers international. He's been an amazing student volunteer at Oregon Sea Grant and he's developing several videos describing the research on COVID-19 transmission. Uh, another member of the team is Aaron Cathcart, who is a senior studying fisheries and wildlife with a focus on ecology and restoration and working as a student education assistant with Oregon Sea Grant develop, uh, to develop uh, applied research findings to community outreach materials and social media. Aaron also developed the art to complement some of the slides in today's webinar. Uh, for exa example, check out the coronavirus who's surfing. Another member of the team is Winnie Kong. She's a recent graduate at Portland State University with a degree in environmental science and management. She met Sam and Tanya through her class project that involved research on Don't Pack a Pest outreach program and joined Oregon Sea Grant to further her research and education growth. Winnie will give us an overview on how we are learning from research on diseases found in water that could be surrogates for learning about COVID-19 in the water environment as the science of COVID-19 evolves. And the last member of the team is Tanya Siemens, who coordinates Oregon Sea Grant's WISE program, which stands for Water and Invasive Species Education. This program emphasizes research guided outreach uh, and develops a, a train the trainer program. Tanya also serves as the science, technology, engineering and math or STEM central community manager to develop and expand this STEM central to support and grow current selected um, AAC and U STEM initiatives such as the uh, National Science Foundation's historically black colleges and universities undergraduate program. And so super excited to turn this presentation over to this team after we learn a little bit about all of you. And so we have a few polls that we will ask to help you all get to know one another. So we have three questions. We ask you about what EPA region are you in and on the screen you should see the EPA region numbers, we change them just slightly to allow uh, an 11th region, which is anyone outside of the US, and we combined uh, regions 9 and 10 because we're only allowed 10 options in the, the polls. So we'll give you a minute to answer that. And then the next question we have is, uh, what are the volunteers in your program monitoring? So if you are connected with a uh, community science program, you can address that question. And the third, introduction question is to identify your affiliation. I'll give folks just a few minutes uh, more to answer the questions. I'm not sure if I can solve the submit button not working. Uh, 
that is a challenge. I have no control over anything except for to turn the poll on and end the poll. So I apologize if it doesn't work. You can add your information into the chat if you aren't able to submit. We'll do it that way. And our, our, uh, someone says you have to answer all the questions before you can submit. Thank you for that. Give you about 10 more seconds. We've got about 150 people of 215 on the line with us today who have answered so far. All right, I'm going to close the poll here and I will share the results with you all. So what we can see is we have uh, the EPA region. We are very nicely divided across the country, uh, about 16% from the Northeast, 10% from the, the Mid-Atlantic, 11% uh, from region, uh, sorry, region two is 10%. Um, Region three is the mid-Atlantic area, 11%. Region four is the Southeast, we have about 12%. Region five is the Great Lakes, around 6% of you. Region six is the Texas, uh, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, uh, around 6%. Region seven is that uh, the, the Corn Belt in Iowa, Missouri, Nebraska, and Kansas. Uh, we have 11%. Region eight, uh, low percents from the, the, the kind of north central area with 2%. Region 9 and 10 combined are our winners at 25%. And region uh, 11 outside of the country, we have 1%, but we have uh, the international representation. Thank you. When I look at the second question, what are the volunteers in your program monitoring? We see uh, the most, 63% are monitoring rivers and streams, 30% lakes and ponds. 16% wetlands, 7% biodiversity, 21% beaches, 7% wildlife, 10% plants, 10% other, and 22% are not affiliated with a, a program like this. And then the last question, what is your affiliation? And you can check more than one. Uh, so we have about 61% government, local, state, federal, or tribal. We have 25% uh, non-profits, 13% academia, 4% Sea Grant, 1% business, 1% kindergarten to 12th grade to education, and 1% other. So thanks everybody for sharing that. It's a, again, a very well-rounded group from many places and, and many representations. So at this point, I will turn the presentation over to the Oregon Sea Grant team. Thank you, everyone, and, and welcome. This is Sam Chan from uh, Oregon Sea Grants Program and Oregon State University. And uh, thanks for the pleasure to be able to share some information that uh, myself and my team have been uh, learning uh, this past summer. And I just want to mention that uh, this team that you, um, that Jill, um, that Chris introduced, is um, they're um, mostly students, and they have actually volunteered much of their time for this effort in, in trying to understand what's known and unknown about this topic, about the presidential presence and risks from COVID-19 in water. So a couple of things I want to share with you is that um, you will be hearing the terms COVID-19. You'll also be hearing SARS coronavirus. You'll also be um, hearing SARS-2 coronavirus. So when you hear those, um, just remember that when we talk about SARS-2 coronavirus, we're talking about COVID-19, SARS-2 coronavirus. And we're talk when we're, we're talking about SARS coronavirus or SARS-1 coronavirus, we're talking about a, uh, a SARS um, virus that um, created an epidemic, uh, mainly in Asia, back in 2003, that actually generated uh, quite a bit of research. Uh, that was... 17 years ago, but that generated a lot of research that we have actually relied on uh, during this current pandemic associated with COVID-19 or SARS coronavirus 2. And so uh, that shows that even though a um, epidemic has uh, passed or has been um, 
controlled or eliminated, uh, the research that we do is something that continues to be important. In this case, 17 years later, it, uh, it serves as a foundation for us to really get going because as, uh, what you see is that there's a lot of research that is going on now regarding COVID-19, but the reality is that much of that is, um, is still ongoing and, uh, and a lot of the publications are, um, are very short-term small studies. Uh, they don't have the benefit of a long-term um, presence. And also a lot of the papers are synthesis papers that also heavily rely on earlier work. So our uh, topic today is the potential presence and risks from COVID-19 in the water environment. So um, Linda, next slide. Um, again, I wanna thank my team and my team thanks you for joining us. And I wanna thank them for volunteering a lot of their time to pull this information together for us. Um, so thank you, next. So I just wanna share with you our agenda. Um, our agenda is also in many ways our work plan that we've been following when we started this process uh, back in the early summer. And so there are three um, key agenda items. One is um, why, why be concerned about COVID and its risk concerns, especially in the environment. Um, so that deals with uh, why we're interested in topic, uh, what precautions, uh, might we are people taking for COVID-19? Uh, what do we know and not know about the transmission of this virus? And so we start off with uh, that form and an overview um, and why it's really relevant for many of um, you, my colleagues in the water monitoring field who are joining us today. And then from there we move uh, really the main part of our webinar is really the knowns and uncertainties about uh, COVID-19 in the water and actually um, coronaviruses in general, because that's where we're still getting a lot of our knowledge, mainly because the current research on COVID-19 is still emerging. And uh, some of it is, it's still uncertain. So we deal with uh, what do we know based on um, uh, current and especially the past and transmission of diseases in the water. Um, what do we know about specifically about the survival of um, COVID-19 or SARS coronavirus 2 in water environments? Um, and more recently, uh, is there a potential risk that this virus can be aerosolized and transmitted through aerosols? Uh, and we talk about the, the ongoing research and some of the outreach that's going on. Uh, then we move into our um, future phase, which is really based upon what we learn and what we learn from you today um, in your discussion and chats is, what are some of these research needs? What is it that, that are still uh, uh, some of the key items that are still not addressed and what are those research needs and uh, should we be taking a precautionary approach to this in that because the science is still evolving but yet we're dealing with a virus that is um, obviously has a high impact on human health uh, and our economy um, what is it that we should be doing that to minimize that risk and uh, how do we balance that um, and what are some of these precautions that we should be doing uh, when we are monitoring water and or we're recreating around water bodies or even living by water bodies as some of us in urban environments do. And then um, moving forward is again, is how can we collaborate on prioritizing what or highlighting what some of those research items might be that we need to focus on, especially for us in, for example, the Sea Grant program or in the extension programs. And what are some of those outreach opportunities that we can do? And so that's, um, that's the progression of our presentation today. We, uh, next slide, please. We will start off um, really looking at um, really how we got here and, um, and thinking about the various systems that we work with before we actually get to specifically the coronavirus uh, because um, uh, we're here all for a reason. That's because we actually um, either manage program, coordinate programs, or actively involved in research or policy, um, or we are volunteers in helping to monitor water, the water bodies near us. And uh, using that, then that information can be used to actually help the greater population to have a safer um, environment to work in, to play in, recreate in. And so when I first started um, thinking about this topic, I was thinking about some of my earlier work that I um, 
did on the Oregon coast, uh, working with different um, watershed associations, different lake associations. And one of those lakes is a really a, a unique and a beautiful lake. It's called, um, it's named Devil's Lake, but it's certainly not, a, <laughs> it's, it's certainly not devilish except for um, uh, the fact that um, there have been area times when um, the lake has had to post water advisories and had to close um, because of harmful algae, algal blooms and um, E. coli. And some of that actually stems from uh, faulty sewage systems, uh, in this case, septic systems, and a history until the late 50s and 60s when Devil's Lake was the primary treated sewage outlet for uh, several small cities along that central part of the Oregon, along the Pacific. And then um, after that stopped, uh, homes were built along the shoreline. It became a popular recreation area, but um, uh, because of high nutrient contents and the sewage flows, next slide, um, we ended up with um, severe aquatic um, wheat problems. Um, and then soon after, there were issues dealing with E. coli contamination um, from various sources, including in some cases failing septic systems. And then um, uh, fairly frequent harmful algal blooms, um, um, cyanobacteria. And so, um, in fact, you see in the photo up in the upper left-hand corner, uh, there is actually a photo of some of that cyanobacteria. Uh, in the early stages, those cottony, um, kind of like pom-poms, and then on the upper right-hand corner is when the lake, in some cases, in some areas, became uh, saturated with uh, cyanobacteria. Now, the lake um, is unique because as a, a part of Sea Grant, which is part of, 30, where Oregon Sea Grant is part of 34 um, university-based programs that really deals with um, the science, um, employing science to aid communities that are connected to the coast. Um, and with that, um, the extension, the education, and the communication aspect. But Devil's Lake, if you see in the lower left-hand corner there, is a, um, is a lake that actually has um, one very unique coho salmon run. It's only genetically, it's, only, it's unique to that area. And it also has a, uh, a unique uh, freshwater mussel association where that coho salmon actually helps in the reproduction of that freshwater mussel. So ecologically, it's very important. You can see it's also a very popular place. People build homes around it. And it's also right next to Lincoln City. And, um, and its outflow is um, about a 200 foot long estuary that flows directly to the ocean. So some people say that arguably it's one of the world's shortest estuaries. So when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about, hmm, we've got um, a history of leaking septic systems. We have a history of harmful algal bloom. We have a history of um, E. coli that have actually caused lake um, advisories and, and closures. Uh, you know, what about possibly um, as part of this monitoring program um, and education, can we actually use an existing monitoring program, um, for example, E. coli, to use that in some ways to think about is there areas that I should be considering uh, cautions um, for coronaviruses? And so um, that's, I'm sharing this as an example. Now, um, um, the coronavirus has not um, been detected. We actually haven't sampled in that lick for coronavirus, but I'm sure that you can probably connect with the situation in, um, in many of your communities. Um, the good news is that this lake, uh, 2017, there was a, um, a sewer line that was connected, but it's a volunteer system. So, and it costs, and does have a cost to connect, and then there is a monthly fee. So um, as that grad as uh, residents gradually connect that sewer line, the E. coli um, um, contamination and perhaps uh, harmful algal blooms might decrease, um, as we change the water chemistry and the microbiology in that lake. So next. So this is actually a canal in New York. Um, um, you know, I started thinking, not just potentially might people be exposed to um, uh, coronavirus. We, you know, we don't know whether or not it's viable or not, but I started thinking about, you know, what about areas like in urban areas, like this canal in New York, where um, there has been in the past 
um, overflows from combined um, sewer and stormwater systems. And uh, in some cases, obviously, the sewage cannot be properly treated or, or disinfected uh, in some cases. And so, um, you know, that's where people, many people, um, can be uh, possibly exposed. But again, so what do we know and not know? So that, that's some of the basis of what we got thinking about this. Next. So um, back in eight, early April, there was an article in the um, Los Angeles Times and the, the article um, in the Los Angeles Times read, scientists are unsure of coronavirus effects at the beach. And, um, and so when, when that article first came out, um, it generated a lot of um, interest and concerns because, but a lot of the interest and concern was because we don't know a lot about what's going on about coronavirus, whether it's in water systems, in marine systems. And, uh, and at that time, we also didn't know much about uh, how coronaviruses, in this case, COVID-19, might be able to transmit through aerosols. But however, um, some of the scientists that were quoted in there from the Scripps Institute, you know, mentioned earlier work where they were actually studying aerosols and the movement of, um, of diseases, you know, although not specifically uh, COVID-19, but actually, so that got us thinking, you know, what about, um, we often hear about the need to social distance, um, obviously, because that's one of the main conduit, but what about the possibility that um, there could be coronavirus-19 or COVID-19 in the water that maybe could be coming or transmitted from um, ocean sources, especially maybe during events where there are um, combined sewer overflows on uh, after storm events. And so that got us also thinking about this process. Next. So, um, so aerosols is something that we will be um, talking about uh, later on during uh, Linda Tucker's presentation, but um, um, because basically because this combination of intense waves and winds can generate aerosols um, and that um, and that more and more we're finding out that water droplets um, obviously are aerosols or a transmission source. Again, that's evolving and um, we don't want to cause um, any undue concerns amongst people, but as educators and scientists and researchers, um, it's something that we have to ask questions about. Again, it's still uncertain. Next. <laughs> so, um, this is definitely an unlikely situation, but the aerosols can be generated from many sources. In this case, this is just a, a large freshwater outflow of, um, uh, from a dam. So with that, I'm actually going to transition to uh, my graduate student, Linda Tucker, who will actually be sharing um, an overview of the different water systems that the virus um, that uh, might that the virus might be present in, and then we'll go into the science. So we'll start off more general, and then we'll get more specific, and then we'll transition to Winnie, who will talk briefly about surrogates, and then we'll talk more about um, coronavirus in the um, environment, and then we'll move into um, a series of summaries, and then uh, with those summaries, we'll talk about uh, what are its next steps. Go ahead, Linda. Thank you. Ah, so um, for some of us who may not have um, come across the term the precautionary principle, this was actually a, um, a concept that evolved in the late 90s uh, that has been adopted more in the European countries, uh, although more and more in the United States, this is something that um, uh, is adopted. But when you think about um, early on during the pandemic, um, uh, being that some of my work actually dealt with invasive species, a lot of our work actually dealt with um, with uh, prevention. That is, how do we actually keep a population of an um, infectious or harmful organism from going into that logarithmic growth phase and establishing and reproducing to the point where it becomes extremely difficult to manage that situation. And so the coronavirus is, um, COVID-19 is one of those situations much like how we manage harmful species like invasive species. And so often in invasive species management, um, it takes us many years, if not sometimes decades, to really find out really um, 
all the uh, biophysical and economic impacts of invasive harmful organism. So oftentimes we focus a lot in invasive species management on prevention uh, when the science is still evolving. And so um, you'll hear us talking about the precautionary principle uh, uh, several times during this presentation, but it's something that we probably do want to keep in mind because the science is still uncertain, it's still emerging. So what do we need to do now? And that's what when we talk about precautionary principle, that's what we mean, and it, and uh, hopefully it doesn't uh, come with all the loaded um, um, uh, poli politics that, are, that have been associated with this thought. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Sam. Okay, so um, first I wanted to talk about kind of the progression of research um, throughout the pandemic. You know, so early on, uh, when, when COVID first arrived in the U.S., there was a, a strong emphasis on you know, catching COVID from surfaces like a doorknob or, you know, a countertop that you walk by, or if you went to the gym, you know, touching weights or something like that. So a lot of the early research um, focused on, you know, how long can coronavirus live on these surfaces? So one study in particular, uh, there, were, there were many, but one um, by Chin et al. looked at a bunch of different surfaces. You know, they found that coronavirus was not on papers after three hours. Um, the the, ink, the Time that it's viable is, is less than that. Um, when you get to wood and cloth, it lasts a little bit longer, up to two days. Um, different kinds of surfaces like glass or bait you note know, could live up to four days. And then on really smooth surfaces like stainless steel and plastic, um, it was up to seven. And then with a surgical mask, you could actually go a little bit further than that. Um, so this is where a lot of that early research was. Um, and actually ended up finding out that um, the concentrations in this particular study were awfully high and probably not representative of what you'd actually encounter in the real world. Um, but this is, you know, this was just really the beginning um, and where a lot of the research focused. And uh, this is why a lot of people started going out and buying, you know, tons of disinfecting wipes and, you know, all kinds of cleaners and clearing out the shelves. Um, but over time, we actually began to recognize that um, those droplets were a problem. We started wearing masks and that aerosols are a potential um, transmission method for this. So aerosols are a suspension of fine solid particles um, or liquid droplets. There are droplets that are suspended in air or another gas. They're really quite small. They're 0.01 to 10 microns in size. Um, and there's been a lot of research um, looking into these and, and they, you know, the science is really evolving and, and they're really starting to, to investigate this. And, and this is definitely a, a very probable method of transmission through these aerosols. So when it comes to uh, transmitting through aerosols, um, you know, it's, it's kind of clear what's going, what would be going on. So in this diagram, if you take, consider someone in the bathroom, for example, uh, maybe a public restroom, you know, they cough or sneeze, you know, they get all these droplets and aerosols with, with coronavirus suspended in them. You know, it's possible that the aerosols might encounter some kind of a toxic substance in the air that actually deactivates the virus. So when those aerosols hit a person, nothing really happens. But it's also possible that those aerosols don't encounter anything. Um, you know, maybe high temperatures or high wind speed might kind of, um, you know, spread the virus around uh, and kind of dilute it or might deactivate it, um, you know, which would decrease the survivability and the person might be okay. Or maybe those aerosols will just hit someone right away and infect them. Um, so the other method with aerosols is when it gets deposited on a surface, which is where that early research was. And, you know, a lot of it focused on disinfection, um, temperature, temp hot temperatures can deactivate it. Um, there's actually some research into essential oils and metal ions deactivating the virus, um, especially garlic oil. You know, so if you've, if you've cleaned the surface or it's a hot surface, maybe you won't catch it. But if you just have, you know, room temperature surface, that you touch, you know, shortly afterwards, you know, there's the potential to get infected. So this is this is a relatively um, well understood pathway, this airborne pathway. Um, but what's kind of emerging right now um, in our presentation in the literature is this kind of fecal to oral route. So consider there's two different ways that this can um, be considered. One is open defecation. So in the United States, uh, indoor plumbing is quite common. So we don't have a lot of open defecation. Um, in areas where there is a lot of outdoor recreation, you get some of this. And it's quite easy for um, human waste to get washed into water bodies. This is why there's guidelines that if you need to use the bathroom out in the wilderness, that you make sure you're a certain distance away from the water. 
Um, but this is also um, an issue with homeless populations, especially in urban areas. They don't necessarily um, have access to that indoor plumbing. And a lot of times, especially I know in the Northwest here, they're often um, living in stream areas. Um, so that can become a problem there um, with contaminants getting into the water. Um, the other way you're gonna see in the US is when the fecal matter actually gets flushed down the toilet. Um, in some cases, there could be leaky pipes that will uh, get the fecal matter um, into fresh water, but also combined sewer overflows are a possibility. I'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, but I'll, probably a lot of the water is actually gonna make it to the water treatment plant um, where hopefully it's treated, but we'll get into that in a bit later. So, you know, these are, you know, the main COVID transmission um, uh, pathways and, and again, aerosols and those surfaces are fairly well understood. And this fecal to oral route is really an emerging, emerging area. So we're gonna talk about what's, what's known and unknown about COVID in the water environment. So first we wanna do a poll on beach closures to see uh, if you've encountered any of them. So if Chris can launch that first poll for us. So have you encountered any beach closures or water use alerts due to contamination, you know, chemicals, algal blooms, bacteria, other health threats? You know, it could be COVID related or it could be, you know, something like E. coli. Um, so take a moment to vet, to vote yes or no. Okay, great. So about 84% of you said yes, you have encountered them, and about 16% of you have said no. Um, so that's not surprising since a lot of you are involved with, um, you know, water monitoring um, and things like that. You're probably pretty familiar with this. So fecal contamination of water supplies has been a threat to human health for a very long time. You know, there's lots of bacteria and pathogenic viruses that are frequently detected in water environments. A big one is E. coli, like Sam mentioned earlier, that most of you are probably familiar with. Um, and there are a lot of really well-known viruses that are spread through the water, which include the norovirus, enterovirus, um, hepatitis A, and uh, denovirus. Um, so what's interesting about these viruses that are very well-known and well tra easily transmitted in the water is that they're actually non-enveloped. So Winnie's gonna explain what that means uh, in a little bit, um, but that's just something to keep in mind about many of the viruses we commonly encounter in the water. So this is important because of the, the pathway of fecal contamination. Um, so there's a couple different ways this can happen. Um, agricultural runoff is a great way to get kind of livestock contam uh, fecal contamination. Um, when floods happen, um, you know, when you saw that picture of the canal in New York City um, earlier in the presentation, um, there have been times that that canal has flooded and you can just imagine everything around that canal just being washed into the water and then making its way into the ocean. So when it floods, basically anything on land is gonna get carried in. Um, stormwater, stormwater runoff also has the potential for uh, bringing fecal contamination in, especially in areas where you have some open defecation. Um, sewers are also a, a big one. Some of you might be familiar with this, but um, I know back in my home state of Pennsylvania, a lot of beach closures due to E. coli were because people weren't showering before going into the lakes or they were taking their babies in with dirty diapers. Um, so that, that is a common way to introduce fecal contamination um, into lakes at least. And last, untreated sewage is a big one, which I'm gonna get into in just a moment. Um, so first I want to poll you on what type of wastewater treatment system you have in your community. So you can check all that apply. Um, so there's uh, three different kinds you might have, or if you don't know, you can select that one. Okay, so uh, it's 
most of you have a separated waste and stormwater system, which is awesome, 59%. So about 34% of you have a combined system, 32% of you have a septic system, and about 11% of you don't know. So that's, that's really great, that, that breakdown. So for the, that 34% of you that have combined sewer overflows, this should be familiar to you. Um, so a combined sewer overflow is basically when you have, if you look at this diagram over here, you have storm drains and, um, and then the sewer system um, from like a home or a business um, where you'd have, you know, the fecal matter are kind of draining into the same line. And that line actually um, comes over here near an outfall and there's a dam to keep the keep it in and then it'll travel down to the water treatment plant. But when you have wet weather, um, especially big storms, it actually ends up uh, overwhelming the system and a mixture of storm water and sewage is actually gonna spill out into the water body. So a lot of these systems are found in the North, uh, Northeast and Midwest and also in the Northwestern part of the United States. Um, so I know a lot of you don't have the system, but quite a, about a third of you do. So. Um, it's, it's definitely an issue. So these combined sewers um, regularly overflow during rainfall events, and there's not a lot of good data on exactly how often they overflow and how much comes out of them. The EPA only decided that uh, cities need to keep track of this um, in 2015, so uh, the data isn't really super readily available, but there is some data that we can uh, look at. Uh, New York City, for example, releases about 27 billion gallons per year. Um, some of the stats on that is that um, about once per week there is an overflow event and some falls overflow up to 70 times per year. The Great Lakes Basin as a whole um, deposits about 22 billion gallons per year and that's a really great uh, comparison. New York City is a much smaller geographic area compared to the entire Great Lakes Basin um, but it uh, sends out a little bit more uh, sewage than the Great Lakes. And then uh, there's actually a figure from the American Society of Civil Engineers that poor infrastructure leads to about 900 billion gallons of that sewage and stormwater mixture um, being dumped into our rivers and streams annually. So that's not just combined sewer overflows. Some of that are just you know, broken and leaky pipes, um, but that's kind of the best figure that we have on a national level. And I just wanted to play a really short clip of uh, the combined sewer overflow in that canal that Sam shared earlier, just so you can see what a really, a really big overflow looks like. So in this video, you can kind of see that line of sewage just progressing forward in the canal. It's, um, it's pretty terrible. If you were to watch this whole video, it smells completely awful. Um, and it's, it's pretty gross. <laughs> So that's, that's probably an extreme version of it. Uh, a lot of outfalls are on the small side, but it's definitely a, a, pretty, a pretty big problem. So another issue are septic systems. Sam mentioned earlier in the presentation um, that there was a lot of issues with septic systems around Devil's Lake. And there are about 20% about of US homes use septic systems. And each year about 10 to 20% of those actually malfunction in some way. So septic systems contribute to about 67% of the reported outbreaks from groundwater contamination between 1971 and 2008. So they are definitely a problem. And septic systems have also been linked to viral contamination of oyster beds in the Northwest. Um, quite often this is norovirus. Um, and, and this is something that is ongoing. Um, it happens every so often. And so septic systems really can be a problem. And you can see it's what basically how they work is the wastewater comes into this tank and then it kind of gets distributed into this drain field and then percolates down through the soil. And the idea is that the, um, you know, the toxins, the fecal matter and all that will kind of get caught in the soil and then just the water makes it down to the groundwater. Um, but if your system isn't functioning properly, um, you know, you can, it can lead to contamination, especially if wells are close by. Um, so all of this is important um, because we've actually, um, scientists have found that um, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, um, has been found in a viable form in human feces. So that's, you know, has huge implications since we have leaky septic systems and we have combined sewer overflows, you know, sending out raw sewage into our waterways. And um, 
a lot of our past research has to do with um, the use of surrogates because we don't have a ton of research on SARS-CoV-2 right now. But uh, Winnie is going to um, talk to us a little bit about um, the two viruses and um, you know their structure and a little bit more about them. So Winnie, please, please take over. Thank you, Linda. All right, I'll be taking over the next few slides here talking about um, the surrogate viruses of COVID-19. Um, so right here on the left, we have an image of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and then on the right is SARS-CoV-19. Um, and just a brief history of SARS-CoV-2, so the one that was actually found in 2003. Um, it actually started the tail end of 2002. Um, and shortly after, cases in Asian countries started to rise rapidly. Um, and uh, shortly after, an epidemic was declared. Um, and I'm sure we're all aware of the short but lasting history of the current COVID-19 on the right. Um, and a similarity among the two is the structure. Um, and it's actually the enveloped um, structure here. And the definition of a enveloped virus is that it's a virus that has an outer wrapping or enveloped and that newly formed virus particles become enveloped or wrapped in an outer coat made from a small piece of the cell's plasma mem membrane. Um, uh, also has uh, lipids. So the envelope may play a huge role in helping a virus survive and infect other cells. And so this structure is very um, important to know because um, it basically helps with their survivability of them. Next slide. All right, and this slide here is a comparison between SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 um, in a table manner. And here, um, the common symptoms between the two are pretty similar. Um, and also the ventilation, uh, the mechanical ventilation requirement is somewhat similar, a little bit more for SARS-CoV at 20 to 30% versus 20%. Um, however, the main difference would definitely be the mortality rate. So as you can see, SARS-CoV is a roughly about 10% versus COVID-19 is about 0.25 to 3% mortality rate. And despite the big difference for the mortality rate, it's still not to be taken lightly, especially since um, COVID-19 is more, um, a lot of cases more asymptomatic. So essentially people that have it don't know that they have it, um, making it more easily transmittable. Um, and so for example, SARS-CoV, when people have developed symptoms already, they can easily quarantine themselves and um, not infect others but that's not the case for COVID-19. Um, then next slide, please. Okay, and then this slide here, we focus on a paper that was done in 2009, and it talked about the survival of a few surrogate viruses um, in wastewater. And we focus on the coronavirus for this um, because it has an 85 to 92% similarity with SARS-2 as far as genetic goes. Um, but with this study, um, they found that SARS coronavirus has been detected in wastewater, but not as infectious particles. Um, and with that, temperature is an important factor in affecting coronavirus survival. Um, and the study showed that at about 23 to 25 degrees, it rapidly declines versus at like four degrees Celsius. Um, and the next bullet here um, shows that uh, because of the enveloped um, structure that we mentioned earlier, the stability and sensitivity to oxidants such as chlorine or bleach or any type of cleaning um, products is um, very limited and it can easily disintegrate. And Overall, the result of this paper show that there was no evidence of coronavirus commission or transmission, sorry, through a contaminated water. But however, caution is still advised by the CDC because this is still a, a new virus and it's a new strain. So we can't really copy and paste the results of um, coronavirus to COVID-19. Um, and lastly, for this paper, they uh, the methods for coronavirus concentration from water should be optimized to have uh, an overall better study for this. Next slide, please. 
And right now I'll be transitioning off to Linda and she'll be talking about the effect of temperature. Yeah, so um, when you mentioned that um, we use uh, SARS-1 as a, as a surrogate to inform um, how SARS-CoV-2 might behave. So this study was done um, in 2005, looking at how temperature affected the persistence of SARS-1 in a couple different types of water. So they looked at hospital sewage, domestic sewage, uh, dechlorinated tap water, and then phosphate buffered saline. Um, so the top panel is at 20 degrees, which is just a little bit below room temperature, and the bottom panel is four degrees. Um, so the pluses are uh, when the virus was still detected and the minuses are when it wasn't there. So you can see that in uh, the top three types of liquids, um, the virus only lasted about two days at 20 degrees, whereas at four degrees, the virus persisted throughout the entire two week duration of the study. And something else that's interesting here is that the virus um, you know, remain viable in the, in the saline solution, um, regardless of temperature. And uh, saline is about 0.9% uh, um, salt, which is um, basically the concentration in human blood, um, which makes sense why it would be, would be stable at, at 20 degrees. So besides SARS, there are some other coronaviruses that can be used as surrogates. Um, they aren't quite as closely related as SARS-1, um, but there's also um, human coronavirus virus 229E, um, also known as HCOV. There's also a, a feline coronavirus um, and polio virus um, that this study in 2009 looked at. And in this study, they actually looked at the titers of the virus. Um, a titer is basically just the amount of viral particles um, in some volume of liquid. And then they put it on a log scale just to make it easier to visualize um, because the numbers can be quite large when you look at the raw data. So the results here are very similar to what we saw with SARS-1 in terms of the, the feline and the human coronavirus. Uh, this dashed line right here is the human one and this kind of longer dash is the feline. So this first panel is 23 degrees C, which is right about room temperature. And you can see there was a, a rapid decrease um, in the titers, whereas at four degrees C, it was actually quite stable. So it's, it's very similar results um, you know, across different types of coronaviruses. So now that we know more about the coronavirus, um, SARS-1 and SARS-2, um, we can start thinking about finding SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater um, since it's been found in human feces. So numerous studies have identified uh, the RNA particles in untreated wastewater in several countries around the world. Um, so we've kind of cited a, a small selection of studies, uh, these eight right here, but there are actually quite a few more um, and more are being published as we speak. Um, so, so this is something that, that people are finding all over the place. Um, but they've actually not studied uh, if it's infectious. Um, there was only one study that looked at this, and they actually found that there was no infectivity in the wastewater. Um, it was a small study, um, kind of on the prelim preliminary side. Um, so this is something that we really need more research to confirm this. And also water treatment facilities should also break down the virus through chlorination and warm temperatures. As we saw, uh, those warmer temperatures break it down faster. Um, there was a study on SARS-1 that found that chlorination broke it down. There is one study on SARS-CoV-2 that also found that chlorination breaks it down. Um, there, with that study, it did require quite a bit of chlorine, uh, quite a bit more than SARS-1 to fully break it down, but that was in a hospital setting and not a general water treatment setting. So this, again, is another area where there's not a lot of um, knowledge and there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, so when you look at this diagram um, from a paper by Mandel et al., um, it kind of summarizes what we know about uh, COVID-19 in wastewater. You know, so we, we found it in many different kinds of wastewater sources, a variety of different um, kind of public sources and in domestic sewage. You know, this brings up the, the case of the fecal oral transmission, um, but we don't know for sure if it's infective or not. And there's a variety of sample, uh, in factors that influence its survival. Um, we already talked about temperature, um, but there's also um, suspended solids and organic matter can actually kind of um, adhere to the coronavirus particles and kind of the virus and protect it. Um, so that's also uh, something to consider. And when we think about the disinfection and the removal, we know that different types of chlorine work well. We know that ultraviolet light works on it, ozone works on it, um, but we don't know if 
you know, municipal wastewater treatment technologies are really efficient. You know, do we have enough contact time? Is all the water being mixed well with the chlorine? Um, we also don't know about kind of uh, more advanced technologies like membrane bioreactors and ultraviolet based methods. Um, so these are areas where there's, there's not a lot of research and you know, there's really that big gap that we need to really focus on if we really wanna be sure on if we can disinfect uh, the coronavirus or not. So even though there's been quite a bit of studies on the coronavirus in wastewater, you know, I mentioned that there was, there was eight studies we cited and then a whole bunch more out there. There's actually been very, very little in freshwater ecosystems. This might be because people assume that, you know, it's going to be disinfected in the wastewater treatment plant. Well, it's actually, you know, not always the case because um, we have things like leaky septic systems and combined sewer overflows. So there actually were two studies that have identified um, SARS-CoV-2 RNA in rivers. One was done in Ecuador, where there's actually very poor wastewater treatment. And another one was done in Italy, which does have a lot of wastewater treatment, but they suspected that a CSO actually overflowed into the river um, at the time of their study. And this study also did test to see if the, the particles that they found in the water were infectious, and it was not. Um, but again, this was a very preliminary study. Um, it's the only one that's done it, so we need to do a lot more research to find out if this is the case. Um, but those combined sewer overflows are something that like, kind of keeps coming up again and again. So this picture on the right hand side is actually from that study in Ecuador. Um, and this is raw sewage um, being dumped into the, a river near uh, Quito, Ecuador. Um, so this is, this is a potential problem, especially in a lot of developing countries, um, you know, like Ecuador and others that don't have strong water uh, treatment systems. Um, it's really important that we find out more about whether or not these particles that are going into the wastewater are infectious, because it's gonna be a, a bigger problem in those places. Um, but still, we have lots of combined sewer overflows in the United States, so it's definitely still an issue for us as well. So we have, a, it's kind of a trend. We had lots of research in wastewater, a tiny bit of research in freshwater, and basically no research in marine environments. So there's been no research on SARS-CoV-2 in ocean or brackish water, and actually none on SARS-1 either. Um, we do know that the virus can remain viable in that 0.9% saline solution, but again, that's not the ocean. The ocean is about 3.5% um, salt. Um, there's some variability there. Um, so it's very different. Um, but we do know that, you know, salt doesn't automatically kill the virus. We can say that there are many coronaviruses found in the ocean um, in different animals, similar in shape and replication to human coronaviruses. And we do know that there's some research on enveloped viruses in marine systems, and they typically decay quickly in seawater at a rate of about 2 to 4% per hour. Um, but these aren't coronaviruses that were researched. They were just other kinds of envelope viruses, um, such as um, herpes, for example, is an example of that. Um, but as for the coronaviruses, there's really no research on this. So this is another really huge gap uh, in the research that um, we really need to know more about. So aerosols are, aerosol and airborne transmission, uh, you know, we already talked about this. It's, it's well recognized for many human pathogens. Um, it's been demonstrated with wastewater spray sites, with flushing of household toilets, um, even just opening a door can, can spread aerosols. Um, so, you know, the science behind aerosols, you know, we know a lot about it. It can spread disease. And cyanobacteria that Sam mentioned earlier um, is actually being investigated right now for the potential to aerosolize, um, which is really important. Um, it is important for humans, but maybe more important for our pets that tend to be um, more greatly affected by the, those algal blooms. So that's something to watch um, in the future as well. So first I wanna go into a poll um, on whether you think it's plausible that diseases can be spread through mist and spray generated by coastal winds and waves.
Okay, so about 16% said it's very plausible. 57% said it's somewhat plausible. 26% said uh, somewhat implausible. And 2% said very implausible. So I think that's a, a good mix. And I think most of you are kind of towards the, the middle of things there. Uh, so in terms of aerosolization of wave, viruses by waves, um, there was a study in 2018 where they had a wave chamber um, with viruses and bacteria and basically generated um, these, these ocean uh, aerosols um, in an experimental study and looked to see, you know, how these viruses and bacteria um, actually, you know, got into the aerosols. And they found that both actually did aerosolize quite fine. The viruses, though, had a lot lower rate of aerosolization than bacteria. So again, aerosolization means, you know, getting that particle suspended into those little drops that are floating around in the air uh, that are suspended in the gas. So viruses had lower aerosolization than bacteria, but they were still there. And envelope viruses were found at higher numbers in aerosols than non-enveloped. So this didn't look specifically at coronaviruses, but coronaviruses are enveloped. Um, so that's kind of important, um, but those are ones that are more likely to um, be found in those aerosols than those non-enveloped ones. And then thinking about COVID once it's in the aerosol, another study done this year looked at, you know, how well the virus could survive and be viable, viable once it's in an aerosol. So they actually looked at um, SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-1. Um, CoV-2 is the red and CoV-1 is the blue. So they did the study over a three hour period um, and they tracked the virus. If you look over here at A, um, the virus was viable through the whole entire three hours. Um, there's actually a greater concentration of SARS-1 um, than SARS-2. And the, the half-life they calculated for it over here um, was about an hour. Um, for both viruses, but SARS-1 was slightly, slightly higher than SARS-2. So again, a half-life is when, is the amount of time it takes for half of a substance to kind of dissipate. So in this case, how much time it takes for half of those virus particles to kind of deactivate. And then they kind of predicted the decay of the virus titers over time. So again, SARS-1 um, was a bit at a, at a higher rate um, and had a slightly longer half-life. Um, but in both cases, both of these um, viruses persisted over three hours in the aerosols, which is really important to consider if you have, say, um, you know, combined sewer overflow that, that overflows near you, and if it has any kind of infectious material in it, you know, it's, it's not just at the ocean, it could even be in, in a river or at a lake. If you have a really windy day, that could potentially aerosolize those particles, and it has the potential to um, bring uh, COVID-19 uh, straight to your face. So now we want to switch into ongoing research and outreach, because again, this is a subject that there's not a ton of research on. And right now, uh, Dr. Robert Quilliam of the University of Stirling is leading a study into the transport of bacteria and viruses in marine environments, which is great since we know so little about it. Uh, Minnesota Sea Grant is monitoring the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in surface waters connected to public recreation sites. And then uh, Dr. Kim Prather at the Scripps Institute is studying the aerosolization of viruses and bacteria in the coastal atmosphere. Um, so all of these studies are really hitting those areas that we really don't know a lot about. So these are uh, research that you really want to follow um, and hopefully they'll, they'll have some results posted soon so that we can really find out more about this since this is an area that just is so important but we have, we have so little knowledge about it. Uh, wastewater surveillance is something else that's been going on. Um, it's basically a method that can be used to estimate the prevalence of COVID-19 in a population. Um, there are a bunch of universities doing this. Um, a few of them include Oregon State, University of Michigan, Stanford University, University of Minnesota, University of Arizona, and, and there's, there's a bunch more. This is just a, a few that popped up. The CD CDC is also developing best practices for sampling, handling, and quality control to kind of standardize the data across the country, because right now it's kind of hard to compare results between uh, different monitoring programs just because they might be sampling a little bit differently um, and have different procedures. And they're also launching the National Wastewater Surveillance System um, that'll hopefully um, address a lot of those issues. And something else to just to mention about wastewater surveillance, um, here in the US, uh, since we can do a lot of clinical diagnostic testing of our population, um, you know, do all those, those nose swabs, um, wastewater surveillance is more of kind of a complementary tool. But in other countries, you know, like Ecuador, for example, where clinical testing maybe isn't quite feasible or is too expensive, this could be a really 
valuable tool, um, especially since it's not super expensive to do. So I think in a lot of developing countries or even just remote areas, um, this is something that's gonna be really important for tracking COVID in those populations. So for our last poll, I just was wondering um, how many have shared outreach resources related to COVID um, in the water environment? Okay, so about 36% of you said yes, and 64% of you said no. Um, so that's not super surprising because this is a topic that um, is really just gaining steam. Um, and the, again, there isn't a ton of research behind it um, with, with SARS-CoV-2. Um, but there is, there is some outreach going on besides um, Sea Grant. Um, Surf Rider Foundation um, has been doing a great job keeping, uh, keeping people up to date with coastal conditions. Um, the NACWA, the Water Environment Federation, um, Massachusetts Bay's National Estuary Partnership, um, University of Vermont Extension, the CDC, you know, all of them have been, you know, starting to address um, this issue of it in the water. Um, in most cases, they're just acknowledging that, you know, there's not a lot uh, known about it, but they're urging caution, a, pre a precautionary approach. So in terms of collaboration and next steps, um, you know, this kind of summarizes our research needs. So the infectivity of SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater and receiving fresh waters is something that we don't really know a lot about. There's only been one study that we know of so far, so we really need to follow up on that and learn more. We also need to know more about the survival and decay rate of the virus in salt and brackish water, um, since we don't know anything about that at all. Uh, we also want to know how well does this specific virus aerosolize through the wind and the waves. And we also want to improve confidence in the technologies of wastewater disinfection, you know, to be effective under a wide range of conditions. You know, because again, you know, the chlorine, you know, seems to work, but, you know, we don't know for sure how efficient everything is. And, you know, this is something that we really just need to, you know, make sure it's working correctly. So again, Sam mentioned the precautionary principle earlier. And, you know, a lot of what we presented is kind of like, okay, we, we, we have a very small amount of research or maybe no research search at all that has to do specifically with this virus. Um, you know, but we shared what we knew about surrogates or other coronaviruses or even envelope viruses. And, you know, I, I think it all shows that there's a possibility and we should use the precautionary principle in this situation, um, you know, it's better to, to err on the side of caution than to end up getting sick. Um, so that's kind of our, our, our angle here is, you know, use that precautionary principle and be safe. Um, so a summary of the conditions with greater risk of exposure to SARS-CoV-2 are gonna be during and after storm events that could lead to a discharge of untreated wastewater, uh, near known sewer overflows, especially those that are not disinfected, like a CSO, um, in water bodies that are near known failing septic systems, um, waters where E. coli is detected or has a history of E. coli contamination. As you remember, E. coli comes from fecal contamination, um, so it's quite possible that places that are frequently contaminated by that might end up contaminated by um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, you also want to, um, other conditions are when coastal conditions are windy with large waves or man-made causes that generate mist or spray or aerosols near wastewater outflows or in waters with that contamination. Um, also areas with posted beach closures or advisories. And uh, but also places where people are in close contact. Um, that's one that what most people know anyway. So a few precautions while you're doing water monitoring or recreation. You know, avoid sampling and recreating during and immediately after storm events near sewer outfalls. You know, stay away when there's windy and heavy surf conditions or if they're expected. You know, take added precautions in areas with a history of E. coli contamination and follow all of those beach and water body advisories and closures. And you also might want to take precautions for your pets and service animals, um, like cats and dogs, for example. Um, they are capable of contracting COVID-19. Um, so we want to keep our furry friends happy and healthy. And definitely wear your PPE, um, face mask or face shield, wear goggles, um, be safe. And this applies not just, we, we, we talked a bit about the, the coastal 
uh, environment a lot here, but this also applies to, you know, lakes and rivers because, you know, you're going to be in contact with water and even areas away from the coast can uh, aerosolize. Um, so, so be safe and wear your PPE. Um, so now I'm going to kind of hand it off to Sam to kind of take us uh, through the take home messages and, and finish up the presentation. Thank you, Linda. Hey, Linda, there's an important question that came up. Um, now the question was asked is how do we, how is it determined whether or not the virus is viable or not? Can you sh share something about some of the most liver tests? Oh yeah, sure. Um, actually, it was monkey liver. Um, sorry, I forgot to, I forgot to mention that. I meant to describe that process. Oh, sorry, monkey. So that particular um, study um, actually collected the, they isolated the virus particles from the water and they actually applied it to monkey livers, uh, like in a petri dish. And uh, they kind of like observed it um, over a few days to see if the cells had uh, any indication of, you know, virus en entry um, and, and, you know, bursting open with the viral particles afterwards. Um, so they, they did this and they ended up, you know, not seeing any changes. So that's how they, that particular study determined if it was infectious or not. And yeah. Thank you, Linda. Um, yeah, performing in vitro tests of uh, virus COVID-19 infection in people obviously has a lot of health and uh, social implications. So oftentimes we have to rely on surrogates, in this case, monkeys. But that's just one form um, that it's done. So I want to share with you, um, you know, as we go into this home, uh, home stretch here, uh, some take home messages, um, mainly because many of you are involved in um, in wastewater monitoring and you actually have a, a large stakeholder group that you actually um, need to be sharing information with. So we put together some questions um, and then towards the end, we actually have a, a, a list of selected references. That's certainly not all that uh, you can actually build on. But, you know, first question is, is SARS-CoV-2 um, or COVID-19 found in wastewater? Um, the answer is yes, um, but whether or not it's found in an infectious form or not, that's still subject to debate. Most of the time, uh, it's found as um, where the uh, coronavirus envelope is, is no longer present, where uh, they're picking up the RNA fragments. Uh, but again, it, it's still, um, uh, that work is still evolving. And remember that uh, here in our country, we've mainly been really dealing with um, with COVID-19 really since about the early part of the year, you know, more, more likely in the March, April, the uh, February, March period. So uh, obviously it can be inactivated, but again, there's still some questions into whether or not um, we're able to inactivate um, uh, all the water all the time when, when we need to. Um, then another question would be, you know, has SARS-CoV-2 been found in natural water bodies? Um, yes, it has been. Um, found in rivers near urban areas, but that's mainly in areas that, at least based on the published literature, uh, in areas or regions with uh, rather primitive wastewater facilities. Um, a question was asked earlier, is it found in areas with uh, failing septic systems? That work actually has also not been um, well established at this point, although it certainly needs to be done as part of our research. But certainly um, in that uh, the paper, for example, from Ecuador, where um, scientists actually sampled and studied and determined the viability of the virus, um, uh, certainly with the primitive systems, um, it definitely could be an issue. Um, now the question is, can wastewater be treated um, to kill viruses? And um, Yes, that's actually the, um, the Water Environmental Federation, which um, is the scientific arm and outreach arm for, our, our, um, for the clean water, many of the clean water agencies and associations and the, in, the um, industry. Uh, they determined that there are many classes of disinfectant and that many of their current disinfectants are very effective. The, the big question is, is that um, do we know, have we actually done studies specifically on the ex length of exposures, uh, the type of quality, the temperatures, all those different combinations. Easy to do it in one combination, but it's a lot more difficult when you have multiple factors to really have a, a good, well-designed, statistically valid study. So, um, but however, also, you know, really not all wastewater makes it through the treatment process, um, especially during those storm events when the wastewater treatment plant can't handle all that and this or, or put enough disinfectant in the system. Um, and then, um, thanks Chris, 
And then uh, another question is, can we get COVID-19 from the water or ocean aerosols? Um, that's a maybe. That work is still, um, it's ongoing in progress. But at this point, um, uh, you know, the science is still uncertain and uh, the risk really depends on where you are at, uh, the timing, uh, and we really don't know much about the COVID-19 survival in marine environments at this point. So uh, I would say cautions advice. So uh, finally, uh, cautions, it's, you know, apply precautions, use protective equipment, and uh, we also need to have a research strategy to address the, many of the research gaps. So uh, with that, next slide, our last slide. Um, I hope that our discussions that uh, we'll have in the remaining time really can focus on what that collaborative outreach will be. Um, and that, that outreach really needs to be accurate, needs to be consistent, and really acknowledges the uncertainty in involving science. Because like I said earlier, this virus has really been with us um, for probably no more than nine months, uh, perhaps even shorter. Uh, next. So Linda, if you can just briefly, quickly scroll through the various references. These are some of the references that we cited. Next, next. Next, uh, we actually have more. And then we want to um, thank you for spending the time to share with us. We actually structured this webinar, um, not necessarily for researchers, but really for us asking questions that you would be asked by your stakeholders. And so uh, with that, I'll turn it over back to Chris and Jill. And again, we thank you for the opportunity to share. And we hope to work and collaborate with you. Thanks. Great, Sam, thank you so much for that um, and team, uh, really fantastic. We do have a couple more technical questions in our chat and Q&A boxes. Um, I'd love for us to tackle those first um, before we get into the outreach discussion, if that's okay with everyone. Chloe had a great question. Um, in areas near CSOs, should we be more concerned about water contact now that we're going into winter, uh, fall and winter and weather will be getting colder and now knowing what we know about um, you know, the uh, virus uh, being detectable for longer in colder temperatures. Sam or Linda, would you like to take that? Yeah, I'll start off first. Uh, Chloe, good, really good question. Um, certainly, we've emphasized our presentation today a lot on the wastewater system. So certainly as we get into winter and we end up with more overflow situations, um, I think our wastewater utilities would try their best to treat that water best they can, but obviously, um, that can always be possible. So we definitely do need to have greater precaution. Linda, you want to follow up? Yeah, I think that's a great question. It's just something uh, I thought about also when I considered the temperature uh, issue, um, especially in fall and, and here in the Northwest too, um, you know, our, our rainy season is over the winter. Um, I, I agree that there is the possibility for greater risk um, in those colder temperatures and with those CSOs. Um, yeah, I you know, there's no guarantee. Um, as we know, the, the research doesn't, isn't conclusive in any manner, but that's something I would definitely, I would definitely have greater precaution with contact in the water around CSOs, definitely. Great, I'm gonna move on to Shanna's uh, question in the Q&A box. Is research being considered to look for potential correlations between coronavirus and commonly used fecal indicators? So something like E. coli or Enterococcus? Um, I'll lead off with that. We have taken the approach that um, commonly used indicators of, um, of biological contamination like E. coli is, a, is a, a good surrogate for our current status because our monitoring infrastructure is well established around the nation for monitoring, for example, E. coli and, uh, and harmful algal blooms. Um, now, have there been research specifically to see whether or not there's a direct, uh, what the um, confidence of that relationship is? Um, the answer is no. Linda, you want to add to that? Uh, no, but the, the, the answer is no is, is basically the answer. I, I haven't seen any, any indication anywhere that any, anyone is pursuing that right now. Um, it would be great if they do, though, because that's, that's, it would be a great tool to use the E. coli and make that connection. Right, because of our current infrastructure, what you are, are doing, or many of you are doing. So, um, but that's a research issue that we want to highlight. At least that's what we've learned so far. Thanks. 
the, the I'll take the next question to throw to you, and that's uh, I think you answered it in that there are no studies, but you can tell me: Has COVID nineteen been found in salt or marine water? Linda, I'll let you answer that one. Yeah, no, no, they haven't. They haven't looked at uh, COVID nineteen. They haven't looked at SARS one. Um, they they haven't even looked at any kind of human coronavirus whatsoever. They have looked at um, gastrointestinal type viruses, and they, you know, they did find some of that. But again, this is a, a nascent work, uh, so we're just scratching that surface on it. But it's, it needs to be asked, though, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are learning 17 years later from um, the SARS virus, um, you know, what Lynn has been referring to as SARS-1. And, um, and there might be another virus that comes along after COVID-19, SARS-2. And so we are gonna have to rely on what we learned in the past. And so uh, we're relying a lot right now on previous research with the earlier virus that is similar. So the, the next question has, it's, a, it's an in-depth question. I'll see if I, I'll read it and we'll see if we can do it. We may have to answer afterwards if, if there needs to be more interpretation. So. Uh, Sherry asks, uh, please comment. So she quotes a newly uh, published paper that says, newly synthesized SARS-CoV-2 viruses released into the intestinal lumen were rapidly inactivated by human colonic fluids and no infectious virus was recovered from the stool specimens of COVID-19 patients. She said the study has a small sample size, but if colonic fluids render SARS-CoV-2 non-infective, then it won't be infective in natural waters that are vulnerable to CSOs. Perhaps then the main risk would be from aerosols that land in water from humans and re-aerosolize. Do you have thoughts on that? There are actually two points of thoughts on that. Um, the first point of thought, and, and I do want to thank uh, Dr. Zhang for uh, sharing that paper earlier on uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection in human small intestine enterocytes. So, um, you know, that certainly sheds some light into um, how human uh, digestive fluids um, are inactivate the virus. But at the same point, um, the work that's, that's being done is really done on a um, very, very small sample. And there are various other papers that have also shown that um, um, there have been live viruses that have been found or active viruses. So um, until we actually do more studies on this, deal with a larger sample size, I think that uh, um, uh, all of these studies have uh, validity within their sample population, their methods, but there's still, I would say there's still not enough. Linda? Yeah, I agree. Um, all the studies that I've read about finding live virus in, in stool, they're, they're incredibly small studies done on, you know, just hospital patients, um, you know, where they might have, you know, 10 or 20 patients that they're looking at. So it's, it's an incredibly small uh, body of literature with very small sample sizes. And like you said, Sam, it's, it's not enough. We need to learn more. Um, but addressing that second point about um, aerosols from humans landing in water, um, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, I think that is a possibility. I think in terms of aerosols um, I've had an ocean, uh, I think there is potential for people to, you know, sneeze or cough on the ocean and for it to kind of mix with those aerosols there and could infect people, um, necessarily landing in the water first, but actually traveling with all the wind, that's definitely a possibility. Um, but yeah, this is an area that I think that's, that's a, a good route to study. Um, and it's, it's just one other thing that we don't know, but it's a possibility. I'm seeing a question here um, that might answer several different uh, folks that are asking. So I'll combine them. If a group were to take on a testing program in their waters, how would they go about it? Um, Linda, I'll, I'll tap you for this one. Um, so is it like testing for um, like coronavirus in the waters? Is that what they're asking about? Yes. Yeah, so um, I know one of the easiest ways to actually um, Kind of concentrate and test for for the coronavirus is actually uses skimmed milk, um, which sounds weird, but it, uh, it you'd have to look into the paper to get the exact details. But it's it basically just um, flocculates and 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 kind of concentrates all the all the virus particles into like a, a little spot. Um, then they'd have to use PCR to actually like test those particles to make sure um, what they are and not particles of something else. Um, so PCR is polymerase chain reaction. Um, which basically you stick these particles in there and it duplicates them 
and to it's a large large enough size that you can you know identify what it is and they put like a template thing in there and it's it's slightly complicated to explain in like a minute um, but basically it's you're, you're putting your samples in there they have like a template of what they're looking for and it duplicates things and, and tries to match it up and um, that's something you'd have to probably partner with a university or a lab um, to actually you know get your samples analyzed but actually collecting them wouldn't actually be that hard um, if you if you look in our if, if you have the opportunity to look up um, the paper about Ecuador and the, the coronavirus in the river, they give more details about how they use the, the skim milk and that might actually be an affordable and easy way to do it. Great, thank you. So I'm looking at the time and I wanna try to keep us to the, the hour and a half that we had planned. So what I will propose is that we can take the remaining questions that are still open and ask our speakers if they would be willing to write responses to those and we can send those out with the recording and if would you be willing to share you have it in your slides but would you be willing to share the, the bibliography of the research that you summarized today as a resource as a word file or something like that we certainly would be pleased to uh, attempt to answer the questions that we are able to answer and we would certainly be uh, able to provide uh, the references that we have at this point. And I've seen through some of the questions that, and points you've made, all of them are excellent. And really that's the purpose of this webinar because this is in one way that this is our way of the, the addressing a needs analysis of really what kind of questions that you have. And so this is a good start. And I look forward to working with all of you and being able to summarize this a little bit better. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, okay. Jill. And thank uh, you participants, you know, my colleagues and also my, uh, my student uh, team here. Yes, thank you so much to all of our speakers. Um, just for next steps, so you know where to find the materials from this webinar, you can find them in the next few days on the volunteermonitoring.org site. We will also put the answers to the remaining questions there. We'll, um, we'll post the chat box so that you can uh, go back to that. And we'll also be posting this to the Mass Bay's Monitoring Resources YouTube playlist, which you should follow if you don't already. Get in touch with us and let's keep this conversation going, um, especially because we didn't get into the outreach component as much, but I was really happy to see a few folks connected with each other in the chat box uh, with similar advocacy missions. Um, that's really great and that's why we're doing this.